Welcome all, welcome to Air Church. We'll be starting in just a minute. It's so exciting to see you here in the chat. Uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this one. Welcome to BYOB, that's Bring Your Own Bible, <laughs> not the other thing. And if you don't have a Bible, that's completely fine. You're still welcome to stay because I will show you all the relevant verses on the screen. And by the way, speaking of the verses, um, everything that is shown here on the screen is linked for your convenience under in the video description. So please check out the link for the slides if you want to follow along later with us or um, or whatever, just uh, they're there for you. There are also other links under this video that will help you stay in touch with Air Church throughout the week. Uh, we have other things happening as well. We uh, stream uh, at other times for audiences in Asia, for example. Plus, uh, you can follow us or just uh, stay in touch through various social media platforms. So make sure that you uh, like, poke, whatever, upvote, share, whatever you can do in order to spread this message, the good news of Jesus to uh, as many people as you can. And if this is your first time joining us here today, I am just so excited uh, that you decided to check us out. And I just, yeah, I would like to welcome you. We, uh, we love, uh, we love uh, each other. We love you with the love that Jesus gives us. So we would like to extend that love to you through, uh, through this message, for example. So uh, yes, we are currently going through, uh, we are currently going through the letter of James. The letter of James, right? And it's an exciting letter, as I mentioned before. Um, it's, a, it's a letter written by half-brother of Jesus and who did not believe who, uh, in Jesus being the Messiah during his earthly ministry. However, later on, after Jesus uh, was crucified and then resurrected, he appeared to James uh, and he, uh, of course, James believed and he became the pillar, the very, found, like a foundation, not foundation, foundation of the church is Jesus, but he became the pillar of the church in Jerusalem. And he's, pen, he's writing this letter to um, to a fellow Jewish believers in Jesus in very uh, in, in in early first uh, century who have been scattered due to rising persecution. So you can imagine because they believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and the majority of the rulers in, in Israel at the time were not in agreement. They they they, uh, they did not agree that Jesus was the Messiah. Well, that's the reason why they crucified him. So that's why the persecution started. So this letter is very, very, um, very encouraging for all of us. And it's, of course, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's part of our Bible and it's very relevant for you and I here and now today. So if you haven't watched the previous episodes, I would like to encourage you to check the playlist as uh, we have been digging in for a while now through the letter of James. And as we are continuing today, uh, we're just so excited to have you here with us. Usually, before I open up, I want to ask God for wisdom on this session, so let's just do it right now. Father God, thank you for your Bible. Thank you for the letter of James. 
Thank you for his concern for his brothers and sisters. And Father, as we read these words today, I just pray that you would turn our attention to you and through your Holy Spirit, that you would teach us the things you want us to get out of this book for this present time, this relevant time that we live in. Father, and I also pray for all those listening. As they listen, Father, I just pray that, and I'm including myself as well, because I always preach to myself as well. Father, I just pray that all of us would be transformed into the image of your Son more and more as we look into your Word. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Well, that's great. I can see people are in the chat interacting. That's awesome. We have such a nice community. Right. Well, the letter of James. Let's get into it, guys. Uh, today's uh, phrase, uh, today's title, I guess, it's called God Willing. So it's not a joke. It's not I'm going to teach God Willing, <laughs> but we're going to go deeper into the idea of how the will of God intersects with our will and our plans. Okay, so stick around for that. I think it's a very exciting topic. Well, but last time, let me just give a very brief summary of what we talked about last time so that it gives you a continuity, some kind of context to what we're talking about. Last time we talked about this world system, the cosmos in Greek, which, and we found out that the Bible is very clear that it teaches this world system is very evil, okay? This, this cosmos is, uh, well, it's ruled by Satan and it's very evil. And not only that, for us as believers in Jesus who have been born from above through the Holy Spirit, we, um, we know we are tempted by it. Even though we don't belong to the system, we are tempted by it constantly. And it has a very strong magnetic, almost like pull towards it, right? So we need to recognize that. That was the message uh, last time we met. Well, then we also talked about the idea that, you know, some people entertain this thought of, okay, I'm going to follow Jesus, but I also need to, you know, live in this world temporarily. So I'll just play this game of having one foot in the kingdom of God and one foot in this world. And we just realized uh, last time that it's just impossible. It is just impossible. We need to make up our mind. We either follow Jesus or we are just dedicate ourselves to this world. And of course, we realize that how do we overcome this temptation? James was telling us resist the devil. And of course, he meant the devil who rules this world. How do we do it? By evaluating the situation and realizing that this world is passing away. This world is not worth our time at all. OK. But we also need to recognize who we really are in Christ, that we have so much more in Christ that this world has to offer. And that helps us overcome. This helps us to resist the devil and overcome this world, just like Jesus has overcome this world. Right. And we are in Christ. So no wonder we experience the same things as he has. Well, and then if you, just in case uh, you are, feel like you're struggling with this world, you feel like it's so difficult. Well, don't worry, uh, because a struggle is a positive sign because God placed you in this world for a reason and he knows your struggles. So as long as you turn to him for help, God is able to help you, of course. And not only that, a struggle means that you truly do belong to Jesus and you want to follow him with all your strength and it just means that you are growing. This is the struggle is usually what uh, athletes experience when they are training their bodies. And that's the reason why Jesus placed us here. We are in this world temporarily struggling with all kinds of temptations so that we can get stronger and become um, become true so that God can actually form the image of Christ within us, okay, as we struggle. So don't worry, a struggle is there. However, this struggle is temporary. And uh, there is comes there comes a time we all look forward to the time when we no longer struggle because we see Jesus face to face and our bodies are renewed. The old Adamic shell is broken. And of course, uh, we are uh, made new in his spirit. Okay, so What's the context of this very, the context of this very chapter is, uh, is as this. Okay, it begins with the first verse. 
because here it's kind of important to realize what James is getting at, okay? Some people take these passages out of context and they try to guilt trip Christians. They try to put on them a special yoke, a yoke of, of works and things like that. No, uh, there is nothing of that here in this passage. So let's just get that, cost, uh, uh, that, that context in, in, uh, to understand it better. First of all, verse 1, he says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Well, is the source not your pleasures that wage war in your body parts? So he says that's the problem. The problem is that you are in Christ, you have a new identity. However, you are still tied to this as we looked at last time, world system and the flesh that is uh, warring against the spirit is, you know, is, is causing all kinds of conflicts between you, right? Between your, you really should be united because you are one. This is how God views you. However, notice that this, uh, the flesh that is within you still causes you to quarrel. And then in, later in verse six, he says, but he gives a greater grace. So the solution to this problem is to turn to God because God is not uh, going to reject you, but as soon as you realize that you are in trouble, you turn to Him in humility, which is the key word here, uh, you turn to God and He gives you more grace. He gives you grace for every day as you are struggling, right? As you are struggling with your flesh. God is the source of grace and He is the source of our victory living in this world. So he says he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So this idea of humility is highlighted here, and we will also continue with it today. Humility is the key in this particular chapter. Humble yourselves, then in verse 10, he says, in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. So if you want, if you ever feel insignificant, or if you ever feel depressed, well, listen, the, the way to uh, self-affirmation and self-glorification is not the way, okay? It's quite, quite uh, counterintuitive. What you need to do is actually humble yourself and then God will exalt you. That's a great promise, guys. I think uh, we can take it to the bank. I think that's an amazing thing to remember. If you want to memorize a verse from this chapter, that would be one of them. All right, so that is the context, the humility, right, in the face of the struggles and the persecutions that these people are facing. James is calling to humility and reliance on God, no matter what the situation is. And then today we're picking up in verse 11. He says, do not speak against one another, brothers and sisters. The one who speaks against a brother or sister or judges his brother or sister speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. Hmm, that on the surface, it seems a little bit complicated. But remember, uh, we have been released from the yoke of the law, right? We have been released from the yoke of the law. So that means if you are... If you are, uh, you yourself, you realize that you have complete freedom in Christ, that Jesus paid such a steep price to uh, secure your freedom by paying your sin and, and that you have been grafted in, that you have been baptized into Christ, you are part of him and the law has no effect on you, no longer. It has no, 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 it doesn't bind you in any way. And yet, if you look at your brother or sister and you try to apply the law to them, what you're doing, you are actually showing that you still uphold the law, right? So you cannot point a finger at someone. You, you cannot, uh, first of all, claim that, okay, I am under the new covenant and the law has no effect on me. It is not binding to me. And yet, at the same time, expect the other the other, right? The other to be under that yoke of the law, okay? So this is what he's saying. You're speaking against the law when you judge your brother and sister, okay? And then, but you still, you yourself, you know that you're not a doer of the law, right? Because none of us are, we realize that, that we are not able to do the law, that it was our new covenant with God is based on not our performance, but on the performance of Jesus Christ, who has fulfilled the law on our behalf. 
and you know so we are we realize that we are not the doers of the law because obviously we can't we can't do it no one has been able to do it except for jesus and then in verse 12 he says there is only one lawgiver and one judge one god right the one who is able to save you and to destroy but who are you judging your neighbor okay so he has some words there maybe there was some quarreling going on there and he's telling them that's that's nonsense you are brothers and sisters you are one in christ christ has accepted you as you are together with all your faults with all your shortcomings uh you know you you really you don't measure up you did not deserve it but based on grace god has fully accepted you based on your faith in jesus so as a result why can't you uh, show that kind of full acceptance to your brother and sister why do you have to judge them um it does just doesn't make sense right very good reminder for all of us so here here i really like this image uh, judging others okay so we are going to talk a little bit this is not the main topic of our t talk today but judging others pointing fingers at others and so on what does jesus have to say about it well in matthew 7 uh jesus says this do not judge or you too will be judged and this is a very famous parable um but let's just bring it up here and i'll try to un unpack it a little bit just a little bit he says, for in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. And this is really echoed in Romans as well. Uh, when Paul is opening up his letter, uh, first of all, stating that, you know, all humanity is under the wrath of God by, by natu natural result of being children of Adam. We have inherited sin and we have uh, inherited the wrath of God. And then there are various groups of people. And one group of these group of people is very moral. They think of themselves to be to be very moral people. And in that opening, I think it's chapter two of Romans, where Paul is saying that those people, when they point a finger at another person and they say, you shouldn't do that, they are basically upholding the law, which they themselves are breaking. So, you know, that means that they themselves are condemning themselves by pointing fingers at others because they themselves are not able to keep that law. And we know that the law does not work like, uh, you know, in, in kind of a gradients of shades of gray. But if you are guilty of breaking one commandment, you are really guilty of breaking the entire law. That's the way the law works, because God accepts nothing but perfection. Right. So Jesus says, if you judge others, uh, you know, based on the law, the law will judge you too, right? because in the same measure, it will be measured to you. Uh, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Jesus says, we all have problems. And you just imagine this guy with the plank sticking out of his eye. I mean, that must be painful and that must be obvious to all, especially to him. It should have been obvious that he has a problem and yet, he is going to, uh, to, uh, to another and he's going to uh, try, says, okay, I, I know better. I, you know, um, because, uh, because I'm more righteous than you are. So let me go to you and I will help you with your problem. Why? Well, listen, Jesus says, how can you say that? Let me take a speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye. I mean that's just crazy you can't even you can't even see clearly right as long as there's a plank in your eye you can't have good vision so that you can help your brother with a little tiny speck in their eye i mean that's why i just love this love this the story that jesus tells he says you hypocrite you pretend hypocrite means i talked about it last time hypocrite is a word that means you're dressing up you're putting on a mask you're kind of acting you're not who you really are. So Jesus says, if you were to do that, you'd be a hypocrite because first you need to take a plank out of your own eye and then you'll be able to see clearly, right? And then you are in a position to go to your brother and say, okay, let me help you. I really, um, I am in a position to help you now. Yes. So judging others, uh, you know, so, and then Another one, this is in John, John 7, Jesus is saying the following. 
Do not judge by the outward appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Isn't that interesting? You know, a lot of people, when they read the Bible, they just focus on the first word here. Notice this one. Matthew 7, verse 1. You know, especially when somebody's doing something wrong or is being criticized or something, some people pull out this wild card. It's kind of like a trump card uh, that they think is going to kind of trump your argument. And they, and they say, well, listen, Jesus told you not to judge because you will be judged. Hmm, wait a second. But that is just, just the beginning of the story. We are not to judge in this manner, like this man was trying to judge another with the plank in his eye. However, Jesus says, do judge. Do not judge about the outward appearance, right? But judge with righteous judgment. So we are to judge, but we are to judge correctly. Judging rightly. What does that mean, judging rightly, guys? Let's think about it. Well, first of all, we see that uh, already Jesus says, not by outward appearance. You see, we are not God. We don't know all the facts. We see something and we tend to react to it. And that just means our judgment is often skewed. Our judgment is often, uh, sometimes what we even see is not exactly what is happening because our senses are, uh, are fooling us a lot of times. Sometimes we are projecting on another person our own insecurities, our own flaws, and we think that what's happening in this situation is how we would have behaved in this situation. And that's, you know, no wonder our judgment is not right when we judge about the outward appearance. You cannot judge without knowing the facts. Don't even attempt to do it, okay? All right, and then also, uh, you know, the removing of your own plank from the eye, that has to happen. So that means going to God and praying for God to show you areas where you need to remove your own plank from your own eye. You have to recognize your own shortcomings before God. Otherwise, you know, don't even attempt to, to remove a speck in your brother's eye, okay? So we, we are all sinners saved by grace. We all have our problems. So with such an attitude, yeah, you are helpful to your brother. But with looking at them from above and with a kind of sense of self-righteousness, that is not helpful. Nobody's going to react to that kind of um, help if you, if you go to your brother and sister with such motivation. And then, yes, in the light of God's grace. So that means we need to realize that we none of us deserved to be in, in God's family. Right? We, none of us deserved to, be, to inherit the kingdom of God. And yet, uh, because of what Jesus did, we are included. And that also means the other. Right? And it has to be done in the spirit of love. I already mentioned it. You can't go to, to another and say, I am going to, um, you know, I'll fix all your problems because I know better what you're supposed to be doing. Okay? No, not with that kind of attitude. But listen, I love you as a brother and sister and actually I know your struggles because I struggle with the same things and you know I notice that these things help me to overcome these and that's why I'm here. I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to build you up. Okay. Um, and from the position of our true identity in Christ. Again, you see, I, I, you hear me talk about this a lot because it's really so important, guys. It's really important how you view yourself. Okay. Because how God views us in Christ is that we are part of His Son. We are in Christ. But our reality oftentimes does not reflect that objective fact. The objective fact is that we are in Christ. Now, our reality is sometimes, you know, stained by this world, by the way we think. And we think of ourselves as losers, uh, no good. Um, you know, but that is not a fact. The fact is that we are children of God and we are in Christ. And so we need to remember that relating to one another is also has to happen on the same level. We cannot relate to one another on the level of the flesh because that's not who we are. The flesh is dead. Okay. And that con also means the flesh of our brother or sister is also considered dead. And we are not to relate uh, on that level. So we need to affirm the same identity in the other, okay? The other ha is also in Christ. Jesus died for them. God is uh, building a new creation within them. God has his own purposes according, according to uh, the promise. 
and we need to recognize that okay in that in that light sure now we are able to judge and now we'll be able to help that person right in the spirit of love very good and this what i meant about this identity in christ and who we really are is kind of uh, uh echoed by paul when he wrote to corinthians in second corinthians chapter 5 in verse 16 paul says very interesting things he says therefore from now on we recognize no one by the flesh okay this is what paul is saying we don't deal with one another on the level of the fleshly adamic nature no longer we don't do that even though we have known christ by the flesh yet now we know him in this way no longer okay so what he's saying is that what he's saying is that you know when jesus walked this earth People knew him according to the flesh. Do you understand? They related to him according to the flesh. Jesus, would you like a piece of bread? Okay, you must be hungry. Or, you know, Jesus is feeling pain. Jesus is um, uh, is limited to one location because he is uh, is he's limited to a human body. Jesus feels pain. He's tired. He needs to uh, sleep, and so on. So the way we uh, Paul says. Uh, when Jesus was on earth in his during his hu human ministry, earthly ministry, uh, I shouldn't say human, he is still a human and God fully, but during this his earthly ministry, Jesus, we, people related to him on the level of the flesh, right? And many people didn't even know who he was. And they were struggling with the claims that he was making. He was saying, I am the Messiah, I am the Son of God. And, and yet people saw the flesh. That's what they saw. And Paul here is saying that even so it is with Jesus. We don't relate with, on, with Jesus on the level of the flesh, but we relate to Jesus on the level of the spirit, right? He's a life-giving spirit. He is seated on the right uh, hand of the Father. He is the rightful judge and the owner of, uh, and, and the redeemer of all mankind and so on. So that's how we relate to Jesus, right? But listen. The same thing is true about us relating to one another. You are not to relate to your brother on the level of the flesh any longer. That's because that's he or she is not, that's not them. They are already a new creation. And listen, uh, verse 17 confirms this. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation, spiritual creation, okay? In the old things have passed away. The fleshly things are not to be counted any longer, okay? Behold, the new things have come, all right? Isn't that amazing? What a liberty, guys. Liberty. So next time you are at church or you're talking to a fellow Christian, keep that thought in mind. It is not what you see, okay? You see the flesh, but it is not who they really are. They are already new creations in Christ, okay? Hidden to be revealed at the specific time. And God will reveal who they really are at the right time. Very good. Well, then in verse 13, James, let's go back to James now. He's uh, kind of switching gears. He's talking about something different. He says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Okay, what is James talking about? Seems like some people... Have decided to make some elaborate plans and maybe they're boasting about them but uh, let's see what is James talking about he's talking about making plans guys what do you guys think making plans is that a good thing some people struggle with that some people are very detailed planners and they spend a lot of time planning details other people just you know take one day at a time and sometimes they they know they should be planning for the future they should be doing something however uh, you know, it's not their personality and it's really hard for them to overcome that. I wonder who, uh, which side of the spectrum you fall on. Okay, I'm closer to the end where I kind of, I know I should be planning, but, you know, uh, I am not really good at that. Uh, so I tend to make either poor plans or just, you know, see what happens. And that's not necessarily good. You know why? Because God wants us to be good planners. God wants us to be wise planners for instance in proverbs 6 uh, 6 to 8 this is what we this is with the wisdom of god okay through the through the pen of solomon 
He says, go to the ant, you lazy one. He says, observe its ways and be wise. Having no chief officer or ruler prepares its food in the summer and gathers its provision in the harvest. So such a small ant, okay, such a small insignificant insect, okay, they know by the changes of the, I don't know, the position of the sun in the, in the, atm in the sky or by changes in the temperature, they know that it's time to prepare food for winter and they work towards it, okay? So even an ant like that has an instinct pre-programmed in, in the ant to gather the food um, because later, uh, you know, the, there will be no, no, no leaving the, the nest, right? The ants will not be able to gather any food. So that's why they're storing food in the summer. And I guess we should also follow that advice and think about uh, making wise plans. Well, in Proverbs 15, we read also that without consultation, plans are frustrated, but with many counselors, they succeed. So it seems that planning is not just a solitary um, um, activity, but we should consult with other people, right? And it's always a good idea. Listen to another person's input, right? So that your plans can be, uh, you know, they're not foolish plans, right? Maybe you're not seeing something. Let someone else speak onto the, onto the plans you're making so that, uh, so that you have, you know, your plan is more secure, I guess. That is the idea behind it. And also in Proverbs, he talks about, um, yeah, even when you're doing some, you know, like making war here, for example, you know, Israel had to make war because uh, its territory was always invaded by the people uh, living in the surrounding area. So it seemed like a, an, a, an annual, uh, whenever the, the good time, uh, whenever, the, whenever the weather permitted, the armies would be sent out to defend Israel's borders. So... Even that requires strategy and it requires consultation and careful planning. So I'm just showing you this to show you that God wants us to be planners. And of course, he wants us to be planners because we were created in God's image and we were given this ability. So, you know, by bearing God's image in us, we also have the same uh, tendencies. We tend to plan and it's a good thing. It's something that comes from God and should be utilized to the most, uh, to the best of our ability. In Pro Proverbs 21, he says, The plans of the diligent certainly lead to advantage, but everyone who is in a hurry certainly comes to poverty. So, uh, poverty or ruin. What he's saying is the planning is not something done hastily, but it has to be done in consideration and with care. Okay? Right. Well, James, but what's, what's the problem with this verse, though? So what's wrong here? Look at this verse again. James says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Let's look a little bit deeper uh, at this verse and see, I mean, because on the surface, I mean, isn't that good? That's how businesses do their business, right? They plan carefully. Uh, and so on. So what is James's problem with this particular verse? Well, is this the perfect plan? Let's see. They, these people decided. First of all, we can see that the subject of the sentence is we. We, right? It's all about us. We are going to do it. So it's not just, um, it's just not me, not just me, but a group of people gathered together and they decided to do something. And it's a concerted effort, okay? They're doing it together and their minds are together, right? Isn't that great? Everybody loves teamwork, right? Yeah, looks like a perfect plan so far. Well, they already decided where they're going. So maybe there's a town on the map that they're going to go to. Um, you remember they are under persecution. So now they are probably going to try to improve their, improve their livelihood somehow. So they are deciding we're going to go to that town and because, you know, we already know our goal. They already decided on how long they're going to go. They're going to go there for a year, okay? So the time limit is decided. They have careful notes, you know, they, were, they had a meeting and they took very care, careful notes. Isn't that great? So far, so good. Looks like a perfect, perfect plan, guys. Okay, I'm almost jealous. I'm almost jealous of this plan because I need to plan this carefully. They also decided on the purpose of this, of this trip. 
they are going there to for the purpose of business okay they already have some idea maybe they will be making something or they will be selling something trading something who knows but the idea is already there you see the business plan is already on paper and printed set in stone kind of right and they already decided what the outcome is going to be guys they are going to make profit isn't that great okay everybody wants that they already decided that they will maybe they did the calculations right they really realized okay the exchange rate is like this okay all oh, those items are popular there so we will make this much profit and so on so what is the problem here so far so good you probably would want your kids to make such careful plans right there's the problem the problem is that they did not factor in god and his will into this plan at all okay so where is god in this picture god is absent it's all their plan all right and there's a deeper problem there's a deeper problem here is that they lack humility okay they have forgotten their place okay they have forgotten who they really are they have forgotten who god is they have for forgotten who they are in christ and what the purpose of the, their purpose here on this planet earth is for the short time while they are being tested in various ways and while god is growing them spiritually okay guys so it is not really the plan that james is criticizing what he is critiquing here is really their attitude behind it okay the attitude was lack of humility and lack of consideration for god's will okay god maybe god has different purposes for them here right very good and so the proverbs again agrees with that for example, Proverbs 27, verse 1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Okay? You may not know. You don't know, guys. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Uh, you know, whether uh, another war will start, uh, we, or whether, um, whether some, a, a disease is going to spread, or whether we are going to live or die. We have no, no, we don't even know what is going to happen in an hour or two, okay? We have some expectations, but we don't really know, okay? We don't have this Cartesian certainty about what will happen tomorrow. Only God knows that, okay? So do not boast about tomorrow. Again, it's the problem of attitude. Not the problem of planning, but the problem of the attitude here, right? And James 4 has, you know, he going back to James, he has the, the solution. He is looking at their plan and he says, okay, Sounds like a good plan on the surface. However, guys, you screwed up in one major area, okay? Because your attitude sucks. Your attitude is not godly. And he says in verse 14, Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. For you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. So guys, imagine a vapor, you know, on a cold day, you go outside, you breathe. It's there, it's visible, you can almost touch it, but then it's gone. Just as soon as it appeared, it's gone, okay? And so James is reminding them of their place, of their situation. So let's consider what James is saying here to us. First of all, you don't know the facts, okay? You, sorry, you don't know the, the, the tomorrow. So face the facts, okay? If you are convincing yourself, if you convince yourself that you know the future, well, that in you're not living your life according to the facts, right? The facts are that you don't know tomorrow. You have some hopes and expectations, but you don't know it really. Then we also know that God, you know, there's a famous saying, he is God and you are not, okay? Uh, so we need to make that distinction. And that's on many levels. God has, uh, he's, he's sovereign. He has his own purposes. Uh, he knows the future. He's, you know, he is exists outside of the space-time domain, and we are not. Okay, we are frozen in the present, and the present is the only thing that we have any control over. Okay, and also, people, this is a funny thing that people keep saying. Uh, I don't know if you've heard this one before. It says, if you want to make God laugh, tell him about your plans. Okay. 
because uh well i guess the main meaning of this is that you know sometimes your plans are not going to turn out the way you want them to turn out so if you tell god about your plans uh, he might just laugh anyways just the saying it's not inspired so don't get, quote me that i said this is from the bible it's not from the bible it's kind of worldly wisdom or christian wisdom let's say your time is not in this world is very brief okay it's very brief. Just consider, uh, you know, um, what is the span of, you know, even if you have, just imagine, you live a long life according to the worldly standards, okay? You live, um, I don't know, let's say up to 90, okay? Let's say 90, that's a healthy age, right? You live uh, 90 years, that's amazing, right? But what is 90 years, okay? Have you studied history, guys? Um, it's not much, really. Um, it's it's nothing at all, okay? In 100 years uh, uh, later or something, where will you be? It's you're not be you won't be here. And then also, you never know when it's time to go, right? You never know. It's so uncertain because you know people have their plans and purposes, and yet um, something happens and uh, the Lord calls them suddenly, right? Uh, accidents happen, uh, disease, uh, people, people get uh, things like cancer and so on. And uh, although we pray for healing, uh, well, sometimes God calls that individual home uh, and that's the exit time, okay? So we are really uncertain about these two things. We don't know them. God knows them. So it seems like it would be fitting to factor in God into our plans, right? Since he knows these things, right? Anyway, so these are the considerations. And also, you need to recognize one more thing, that your own life, which we talk about, me, me, my plans, my, we, you know, like these people in, in James uh, earlier, we are going to do this. Well, just a second. You are not your own. You have been purchased. You have been purchased with a very expensive price, the blood of Jesus, okay, purchased you, redeemed you. Uh, really, you are no longer your own. And anyway, you don't want to be your own because if you are your own, then, you know, this world is all there is. But you really belong to God. He has authority over your life, right? He can take it at any time if he so desires in his wisdom, if he sees that fit, okay? So recognize that your own life is not your own. It belongs to God, okay? And the sooner you recognize that, the better, okay? Because that's where our joy lies, okay? Our joy is in knowing that God is love and God is good and that we belong to Him. He's taking care of us. He's able to meet our every need, not only in this life, but also in the one uh, to come, right? Yes, so recognize these things. Psalm 39 says the following, Lord, let me know my end and what is the extent of my days. Let me know how transient I am. Transient means temporary, right? Yes, yeah, so it seems like there is some wisdom in the fact that you know that you are not going here for a long, you're not going to be here for a long time. There's wisdom in that. Then in verse 5 says, Behold, you have made my days like hand widths and my lifetime as nothing in your sight. Certainly all mankind standing is a, all mankind standing is a mere breath, okay? So hand width was a measurement, you know, they used to measure things in cubits, which was kind of the length of an elbow, and a hand width is even smaller than that, okay? So, you know, on the timeline, just imagine you have a timeline, eternity, from infinity to infinity, and now on that timeline you're going to place the width of your hand, or maybe, you know, let's say uh, even uh, 12 inches, or like even, you know, let's say 30 centimeters on that line is nothing, right? So certainly all mankind is mere breath, okay? So there's wisdom in recognizing that fact. Psalm 103, similar idea, he says, As for man, his days are like grass, like a flower of the field, so he flourishes. Yeah. You know, sometimes the, the spring comes, you look at the fields. All right, there are some flowers there. Well, nice. But a week later, two weeks later, there's no more flowers. Okay, the color is gone. So it is with us. Number in verse 16. When the wind has passed over it, the grass, it is no more. 
and its place no longer knows about it. And this really reminds me of the fact I used to, um, I used to live in Asia. I lived in Asia for a long, long time. And, you know, that was part of my life. I was there, I was act actively involved, I was uh, working and doing things. And, and, you know, later, after leaving the place where I used to live, I had a chance to visit it. And it was maybe like five years or seven years, no, five years maybe, after I, le I had left it, I had a chance to visit it again. And you know what? The, one of the depressing thoughts, or actually not depressing, but, um, but kind of so, sobering thoughts, was that there was not a part of me there left anymore, okay? Everything there has already changed. Everything has transformed. I was no longer there, okay? Do you see what I mean? Of course, uh, my memories remain, my, uh, everything that I you know, invested in people, whatever I invested in people, whatever uh, things that maybe I've, um, you know, I, I've spent time with, uh, developed relationships, that still exists. However, other than that, there is no part of me there anymore, right? So at first it was depressing to know that, but on the other hand, it was a very valuable lesson because it teaches us that really the present is what we should be valuing, okay? We should be valuing the present because in the present, we can make an impact on someone, okay? All right, Psalm 90 says, so teach us, teach us, Lord, the number to number our days, okay? Teach us, so there's, again, wisdom in knowing that you're not here forever, that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Very good, okay, I hope this makes sense. No, going back to James 4, 4. okay, so he... He just told them, you don't know the future. Now, instead, you made your plan, but you should, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this and that. Okay? Notice, James is not saying, okay, before you even say the name of the city, before you say uh, that how long you're going to stay there, before you even say uh, that you're going to do business there, and before you even start sharing your profits, which are not real yet, Maybe you should stop and think, ask this question. Am I, are we going to live <laughs> tomorrow? Are we going to live tomorrow? Okay. And if the Lord wills, acknowledge God in it, we will live. And then we will also maybe do this and that. Lord willing. Okay. So this is uh, what James is rebuking them for. Okay. Not for planning. Planning is good, but not acknowledging God. Proverbs Proverb 16. Commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established, okay? So obviously that means involving God in making your plans is really important. The mind of a person plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps, okay? It's the Lord who directs his steps. And let's see if that's the case uh, with, uh, under the New Covenant, you know, the, the one of the most, the prolific, the most prolific writer in the New Testament is um, is Paul, but before we even examine Paul, let's see, uh, let's see what he's saying in Acts, because Acts was written by Luke, but, uh, but these are the words of Paul. Uh, when he, when the, when the people wanted to stay here, stay, um, in, in, for Paul to stay with them, uh, this is what Paul said to them. When they asked him to stay for a longer time, he did not consent but took leave of them and said, I will return to you again if God wills, okay? He says, if God wills. So he's expressing his desire to see them again. However, he knows that everything is contingent on God's will. If God wills it, yes, I will return to you. And then he left from Ephesus, okay? So Paul was practicing this, practicing this attitude. He had the correct attitude. Later on in 1 Corinthians 4, we also see a phrase like this, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills, okay? Again, this is um, an expression of that, it, that shows his attitude. Uh, later on in the same letter, he says, For I do not want to see you now just in passing, for I hope to remain with you for some time if the Lord permits, okay? So even Paul's plans, Paul has accomplished so much. I mean, he's traveled all over uh, the Mediterranean and then the Asia Minor, right? And then into Rome. Amazing, amazing things he has accomplished. And yet he always kept in mind this idea that 
well, my next step is contingent on God's Lord's will and uh, his permission, whether he's going to allow me to do this or not. Okay, so this phrase, if the Lord wills, or God willing, the title of our today's message. You know, I must say that sometimes this word becomes kind of like um, almost an excuse. I know that um, on many occasions I had a chance to work with, uh, you know, there's, for example, uh, in, in other religions, for example, in Islam, there's this idea that's very prevalent. So Muslims often say inshallah, inshallah basically means if Allah wills it. But I've noticed that sometimes this phrase can be abused because it ends up being sort of like, a, like an excuse. Okay, I'm making an appointment with you tomorrow. Let's say I'm going to meet you tomorrow at five, inshallah. <laughs> and that might mean that, you know, if I'm not there, <laughs> well, that's kind of like, well, I guess it wasn't meant to be or something like that. But that's not the case. That's not how it is used here. What, what we are doing is we are actually recognizing the will of God as superior to ours. And we are basically, uh, it is not the word, it is not the phrase that we should be saying. Okay. So I don't want you to think that Christians should just like Muslims say inshallah every, every time they make a plan. It's not that we should be saying this phrase, but we should have the proper attitude when we are planning and expressing plans to others, uh, keeping God in, in view when we are making plans. And so then in Ephesians 5, we see uh, the same idea echoed by Paul. He says, so then be careful how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Okay. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So it seems like there is the will of the Lord. Okay, there's the will of the Lord. Just let's look at it as, um, let's say, let's say it's like a like a river. Okay, and now we are in the in the Lord, right? We are in Christ, and our purpose here on this world, in this world, is to do the will of God. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to understand, it seems like we need to understand, first of all, what the will of God is, right? And that implies spending time in prayer, right? A thinking of, okay, how I can bless others? How can I extend the love of Christ that he has shown me to those around me in some, uh, in ways, through ways that God gifted me for, okay? And now, as we, in prayer, we kind of, uh, you know, um, reset our compass and we realize, okay, now, if I'm in the will of God, in the general will of God, of spreading the gospel, of loving others, now I can start to, you know, because the time is short, I can try to make plans that are outside of God's will, but they are not going to prosper. That would be foolish, okay? Because God has his ways of either altering my plans, okay? For example, think of Jonah, you know, Jonah didn't want to go where God wanted him to go, to Nineveh, okay? God, he didn't want to, he wanted to go the opposite direction and yet God had his ways of bringing him there. So that's what uh, Paul is talking about in Ephesians. He says, time is short, be wise, recognize there's the will of God and his purposes and now within that, river now you can craft the stream that you want to take the path that you want to take and of course god is going to bless that right because the will of the lord he wants you to he wants uh, for you to get involved in first john in the first letter of john we saw uh we saw what he was saying we may, we actually visited this passage last time but i think it's so important uh, because we have our own selfish goals, our own desires, right? And we sometimes make plans in accordance with that. And sometimes God will allow them to take place. But then it is for, for the sole purpose of teaching us that they're either not fulfilling, um, there's no fulfillment in that, and then we come back, come back to God. Uh, and sometimes God is, can just change our plans just like that because his plans for us are better and we did not consult God about our plans and this is why we are sometimes in shock, okay? So this is what John said last time. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life 
is not from the Father, but is from the world. Yeah, we talked about this, this evil world system. The world is passing away and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God continues to live forever. Okay, guys, two things in that verse 17 I want to highlight today for the purpose of this study. First of all, he says that the, the world is passing away. So if you have worldly plans, worldly goals, well, be very careful. Are they worth pursuing? Because they are going to, whatever the worldly goals are, they're going to pass away. You're going to be left without anything, right? Uh, but also another point is that he says that um, those who do the will of God continue to live forever. Okay. Now, let's, that's you and I, guys. That's you and I. We live forever. We know that because we are in Christ. Okay. Our eternal life has already started when we placed our faith in Christ. We have identified ourselves with him in his death and in his resurrection. We are already uh you know god is building a new creation in us we have this new life in us eternal life but notice if all those who do the will of god continue to live forever you could also flip it around and you could say those who live forever do the will of god right and note just look at your life i'm willing to uh, assume that actually you are in many ways you are doing the will of god okay because God is able to, to guide you in that direction. Do you remember Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. Yeah, I shall, not, um, I shall not want. And then it talks about this image where the shepherd is using a staff. All right, staff. And the staff is, uh, there's a two, two, uh, there, there are two reasons. His rod and his staff comfort me, right? The idea is that, you know, the staff is a defense weapon, so that means that God is, uh, you know, is, is watching over you, does not allow you to, uh, to, to experience evil beyond what he, can, what he allows, but also the, 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 the staff can kind of direct the sheep a little bit. Okay, the sheep is going off a little bit on a tangent here. Okay, lovingly, tap, 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 come back here, come back here. I don't want you to be going off there. You're going there, okay? And what happens is the sheep ends up doing the will of God, whether it is willing or not. Uh, so, guys, just be of good, uh, good cheer. Be encouraged that God is able uh, for us to work out His will in our lives. But the main focus today is that we can cooperate with that. We can be, enlist ourselves in this great process, right? That's the great, uh, great privilege that we have. But as it is, James, you know, he's concluding this, uh, concluding this passage. He says, but as it is, you see, you boast in your arrogance. You guys are, are so arrogant because you excluded God, God from your planning process. All such boasting is evil. Okay. All such boasting is evil. Right. For, so for one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, for him it is sin. Okay, so this is very interesting. So, you know, there are a lot of people, I'm sure you, I'm sure you know such people uh, who maybe they have their retirement plan already planned out. Okay, I'm going to work for five more years and then I'm going to retire, do this. And oh, when, when you hear these stories, uh, you sometimes feel like, oh, wow, like I, I have no plans like that. I don't know. Okay. But listen, here James says that boasting about these worldly goals is actually arrogance and it's evil because it's of the world, right? So you don't have to feel bad that maybe you don't have such detailed plans about your future. Of course, it's good to make plans, but boasting about them and kind of excluding God from the picture is not. It's evil, okay? Um, and then in verse 17, he says, for, uh, so for one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, for him it is sin. So for example, so I think this is saying about this. If you know what the right thing to do is, you know what the will of God is in your life, and yet you're trying to pursue, uh, pursue other goals, okay? Yet for him it is sin. Okay, notice, it is not saying that it is sin and God will judge you for the sin. But it is saying, for him it is sin. 
So it is all about your mental, um, mental state of being, okay? So imagine, here's a Christian who knows, yes, I should follow Jesus with everything, with my, with my, um, with my abilities, my gifts. However, you know, I'm going to play this double-minded game of, okay, uh, I have these worldly goals, I would like to do this, and, and you know, and in their mind, they know they should be doing one thing, but they're doing another thing. And they, their own mind is condemning them, okay? And this is what James doesn't want these people to experience. He wants them to, to live in, uh, you know, in this liberty, the freedom that Christ gives us, okay? And that's the kind of thing that he says, you know, of course, if you're trying to do something else other than God, God's will, then no wonder your own consciousness, uh, no, sorry, your own conscience is going to accuse you. It is not that God accuses you. Remember, we are no longer under the law and we are not judged based on our, appearance, uh, uh, our performance. We are judged based on Christ's performance. However, our own minds will condemn us if we don't follow God's will. Um, even though we always have these options open and God allows us to not follow God's will. And yet, you know, James is trying for them, you know, he's, he, he says, he goes out of his way, understand this, guys. Be, God's will is the best anyway. Choose it. Choose it um, uh, with, with, uh, with your full knowledge of what it is. So there are some reasons, guys, why we oftentimes do not want to consult God when we make our own plans and when we make big decisions, okay? And I'd like to highlight some of them because, um, you know, you might recognize them in yourself. First of all, the, ver the flesh, okay? We still live in the flesh and it has strong impact on our decision-making sometimes. It shouldn't. It really is already dead. God is not discounting it completely and we should discount it completely too, but it's still in this world has its, uh, you know, it tries to rule our life constantly, okay? So the flesh has its own selfish goals. I want to achieve this. I want to, um, you know, I, I, and sometimes selfish desires, like um, I want to be recognized. That's why I'm going to plan this so that now people have to uh, look at me differently, okay? and self-glorification. So, see, this is my plan. I put it together and there's some pride in it. Yes, I carefully worked on it and I don't want God in the picture because, you know, it's my plan. And if it succeeds, I will be able to take credit for it. Okay, do you see? That's the mechanism that the flesh is operating under. And oftentimes we get duped into that kind of thinking and we get suckered in and we just follow all along. Say, yeah, that's my plan. but that's, that prevents us from consulting God because actually we don't want God to look over our shoulder and, you know, who knows, he might not like some of these things. <laughs> Maybe subconsciously we already know that he may not agree with these plans. But, uh, and for that reason, you know, we just shut him out, okay? Well, another reason is the world system, okay? We don't consult God because of this world system. And we talked at length about it last time. Please check out the previous video in the series. But the world system is, has a different values, okay? The world values are, yes, you are a self-made man. You need to strive. You need to make plans. Your plans are yours. You're alone, right? You are the captain of your ship, right? That's the kind of the anthem of humanism. Uh, and your upbringing too. Maybe your, your parents also instilled in you this kind of independence of, which is good. On the, you know, there's nothing wrong with being independent. But the idea that, you know, you should be taking care of yourself, you should be making plans and so on. But maybe they forgot to mention, well, pray about it. Ask God what he thinks about it. Okay. So the upbringing can weigh in on it. The culture as well, especially, you know, in North America, in our Western culture, there's this is, you know, the individuality and it's just one of those values that is uh, uplifted and and maybe that's one of the reasons why some people just are not used to uh, thinking about it. Okay, I should consult God regarding my plans. And the final reason, maybe one more I thought of, is the enemy. It's himself. You know, he doesn't want you to be doing God's will. He would rather have you uh, run on tangents doing other things uh, that don't satisfy, but at least give this, have this promise of satisfaction. 
And what he will end up doing is that he's going to cause you to mistrust God, uh, to sow a seed of doubt. You know, maybe God's plan for my life is not, uh, not the best after all. You know, look at all these... Uh, look at all these early Christians, they were martyred, you know, they died painful death, you know, maybe that's not exactly what I want for myself. Uh, you know, uh, God is, you know, he's going to take my toys away, right? I'm chasing this new toy now in my life and I want to get it so badly. And if I consult God about it in my decision making before I make that purchase, you know, God might want to want tell me that you know, he, he's, he doesn't want me to have fun here in this world, okay? But it's a lie, guys. It's a lie. It's a lie of the enemy. And if you find yourself there, well, please, quickly recognize it for what it is and run to God. Run to God for, for you know, the renewal of your mind again. We talked about it last time. And sometimes we just forget. Sometimes we're in a hurry. We, we, you know, it's, uh, it's out of haste. And sometimes we just act on impulse. And, oh, yeah, yeah, I need to do something. And we just come up with a plan, which is not very good. We didn't pray about it. We didn't think about it. And sometimes it's just lack of patience. For example, you've been waiting for something. You're making, waiting to make a decision. And maybe you prayed about it and then nothing is happening. And then you're just running out of patience. Says, well, you know what? I'm just going to do it anyway. Or I'm going to do what I'm just going to do this plan now. And it's oftentimes a mistake, guys. So these are some reasons why we don't consult God. So we need to listen, really. We need to uh, have a proper view of God so that we are willing to bring him in on our plan making, right? Well, here's something I found on the internet this week, and I just wanted to show it to you. Um, because, you know, how to recognize the God's voice when you are praying, let's say you're praying about your plans, or, and how to recognize Satan's voice, the enemy's voice. So I'll just enlarge it for a second. And you can see that God's voice, you know, he stills you. When you pray, he will still you. He will give you calm. But Satan's voice, he will rush you, okay? Or he will rush you into a, making a decision quickly. Uh, God will lead you. God will lead you. But Satan will push you. He will push you to make a decision. He will push you to... Uh, to make a certain plan. Maybe you don't agree with it completely, but you're going to decide to do it anyway. God reassures you, okay? God's voice will reassure you. He says, yes, I am still there. I am unchangeable. I love you. I accept you. And um, however, the enemy's voice will tend to frighten you and it will, uh, it will cause you to make plans that are um, you know, in the, in the wrong frame of mind, that you're doing it because you're afraid, okay? And that should never be a Christian's position, okay? We have nothing to fear, nothing, nothing in this world. God's voice enlightens you. It teaches you something new, right, about himself or about you. But Satan's voice will only confuse you, only confuse you. Uh, God's voice comforts, comforts us, okay, knowing, yes, I... You know, I appreciate that you, uh, uh, you sought my input on your plans. God is saying, okay, I will bring those plans into fruition. I will bless those plans, okay? But Satan's voice will make you worried. Oh, what if this happens? What if that happens? So you want to make sure that you are in God's will so that you don't have these worries. Because if you are in God's will, <laughs> nothing can stop that thing from happening, okay? Yeah, the calms and obsesses you and the finally convicts you. So God's, uh, God's voice, if you pray, God will convict you and say, okay, uh, here you are wrong. And here is the right way of doing things. And he will kind of restore you as well. But Satan's voice will do none of that. He will just condemn you. Okay? He will just condemn you. Right. So I think it's a very nice, nice kind of comparison. All right, very good. Yeah, so taking God into account when we are making plans. Let me share some tips with you for making plans. Well, we already saw that committing to the Lord is so important, right? Committing our plans to the Lord, right? So whatever, when you make a big decision or something, well, pray about it. Give it to God to see, you know, what he's going to say about that. Uh, see in the word, spend some time in the word to see if you're if this plan is glorifying him, if this is useful, okay, if this is good for, 
um, for his kingdom, for extending Christ's love to others? Uh, well, also recognize that God's will is superior to yours, okay? Super, superior and uh, supreme in many ways. And really what you want is you want God's will in your life. You, you don't want to be outside of that boundary, okay? Uh, because uh, in God, within God's will is where the true blessings blessings lie. And then acknowledge that in this world, you know, you are just a temporary pilgrim. You are an alien. You are in hostile environment. And you are going to be gone out of here. You will be going home and we don't know when. It could be tonight. It could be um, tomorrow. It could be any time. You know, we have to be ready. We have to pack light, right? And yes, fully embrace your identity in Christ. You are not of this world. Therefore, your, your goals, your plans should also reflect that. You are in Christ, okay? And of course, even if your plans don't come through, you should always rejoice, okay? Because if they didn't come through, that means God has had some, his hand in it somehow. He has his purposes in it. And it's a good thing, okay? So regardless of the outcome, remember to rejoice because this is how we can be faithful ambassadors of Christ to others, right? Uh, Paul wrote in Philippians that we should rejoice in the Lord always. Well, what's the takeaway from today's lesson? Well, first of all, we see that planning is a good thing. God gave us abilities to plan and we, He wants us to make wise plans, okay? So we need to plan. We need to plan, but how? Well, with humility, okay, knowing that we are not in control of the future, knowing that God is in the future and that he is going to direct our steps, okay? So we need to take God's uh, opinion or God's uh, just authority into account when we make our plans. We need to consider the idea that when we bring in God into our planning, that is also one way of worshiping him, okay? It's recognizing his authority in our life and to have God weigh in on our decision making, have God being part of the planning process is a form of worship, okay guys? Worship is not something you do on Sunday uh, where you jump up and down or sing songs, okay? This is uh, every time you get up, you, you know, 24-7 is everything you do is a form of worship. Well, then we also need to recognize that God is a planner. He plans, okay? And his plan is the best, okay? So, and yet, God is offering us, even though we are completely free, Jesus set us free, we could go our own direction, our own way. We, we could, you know, completely do something different than God wants us to do. And yet God offers us this amazing privilege of being involved in his plans, okay? And his purposes what he's doing. He's bringing people from all nations to himself, to the knowledge of Christ. And we can be a part of that if we co cooperate with him. Enlist, uh, you know, we are enlisted in this process. And I think if we can just switch that mindset from, I want to pursue my plans to, no, I really want to pursue God's plans. And within that framework, you know, God help me pr create a plan that is glorifying you. That is a great privilege, guys. That is a great privilege, and I would encourage you to do this. And of course, life is short. I'm not saying life is short. Our life is eternal, but life in this world is short. So we need to focus on what's important, okay? So a plan may be good, but maybe there is a better plan that we should discard this plan in lieu of this plan, because this plan is much better considering how short our days are on this world, in this world, okay? And finally, if you are in Christ, are you planning for eternity? Okay, <laughs> this is a big issue. Okay, God, our Heavenly Father wants to richly reward us. And this is another motivator for us to, you know, we're planning for eternity. Okay, this is very wise. It's very wise to, to be um, in accordance with God's will in our life because this is not the end. We are planning for eternity here. And... If you are not in Christ, you can do this right now, okay? If you are just listening to this and you think, oh, none of this applies to me because I'm not a Christian. Well, listen, you can settle that matter with God here and now, today, okay? Jesus died for your sins. His arms are wide open and 
He can accept you with all your faults and shortcomings just as you are. All you need to do is come to him in prayer and trust that his work on the cross for your benefit is what uh, brings you closer to God. So exercise that faith. I trust that you will do that as you listen to this and plan for your eternity. Okay. So thank you so much for sticking with us until the end. We are going to uh, wrap up with some self-reflective questions. First of all, what is this passage teaching you about God? Well, there's so much here to me. One thing that really stands out is that God is so gracious to us. He gives us grace and he even allows us to make plans without his consideration, without considering him. And regardless whether these plans succeed or they fail, he's allowing us to learn these important lessons. Okay. But at the same time, I think that, you know, God is, we need to remember that God is not some kind of mean um, man sitting up there on the cloud who wants to take our toys away, but he really wants to bless us richly. And this is why we need to uh, consider this, making wise plans and consider him in our planning so that we can benefit uh, from lasting rewards and blessings, not only in, the, in eternity, but also in the, in the present time, right? Of knowing, having that comfort that we are in the will of God. So I think, um, I think that is just an amazing thing. God is so gracious to us. So if this is true, well, maybe you were making some big decisions in your life without uh, counseling God, okay? without praying about it. So if that is the case, I would encourage you to actually do something about it and actually go to God in prayer and, you know, say that, admit it, say that I have, you haven't been doing that. And now, you know, the way you, the way you spend your money, the way you spend your time, the way you spend your energy, maybe, you know, let God ha have his say on these things in your life so that your plans can be established okay commit your plans to the lord and they will be established so well let's do that through prayer and as you do this i just pray that you would also uh, communicate these things with others okay share them we are god left us here as a family to be members of one another not just members of jesus but also of one another and you can be a blessing to others by sharing these things and as you do that, who knows, you might bless others. And if you hear somebody sharing this, you might be blessed by them. Well, that's all for today. I am just so excited again that you were able to stick with us until the end. That's so encouraging. I just want to say how much I, how much I appreciate every one of you. Uh, this is just amazing. What a great privilege it is for me. Before I close, let's just thank God for this word. Father God, you are so good to us and so gracious. Even though we stray, we go astray, we make our own plans and we don't let you in on our plans. We don't want you. We fear that you are going to take our plans away. Father, I just pray that, uh, first of all, I thank you that you allow us to do this. And yet would you give us grace that as we recognize these things, you restore us right back to yourself. Father, teach us to commit your, our plans to you and uh, try to honor you in our plan making. Father, I also pray for everyone that's listening uh, to this, that as we do that in our lives actively, that you would continue to transform us into the image of your Son. And to him be all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you all. Be blessed. Check out the links in this, under this video description. Don't forget to subscribe, like, hit that like button, and I'm looking forward to seeing you next time on BYOB. Bye.